Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation to have me participate in your celebration. And if I can have my first slide up. I uh, very much um, am pleased to be here and to really open this day-long uh, set of, of talks, um, which I think very much capture um, some very exciting things that have happened and that will be happening in the future in biomedical research. What I'm going to do is basically take you on a journey. Um, this journey relates to the field of genomics, both what it has done and where it is going. And, and in particular, what I want to really do is to talk about several major phases of genomics. I'm going to first talk about the first three decades of this field. Really, that's the past. Then I'm going to talk about the present and describe to you some of the real new realities that we face. With them come some pretty exciting research opportunities. And then at the end, I'm going to briefly touch on the future uh, related very much to the theme of today, and that is thinking ahead. Uh, what are the challenges? What are the exciting opportunities? And we're embarked on a strategic planning effort um, to sort of tell us a little bit about what genomics is going to bring in the next decade. So let me open by describing uh, this first three decades of this relatively young field. I hope all of you appreciate how young the field of genomics is. In fact, if you look in the scientific or biomedical literature, you will never see the word genomics in print until 1987. In fact, it was in this lead editorial of a new journal that had just been created called Genomics, where the editors of this new journal described this newly developing discipline uh, that was given the name Genomics. Now, the reason why 1980s were sort of a pivotal time to create a new field was because all the tools and technologies associated with analyzing DNA, cloning DNA, manipulating DNA, and reading DNA had advanced considerably in the 1980s. And it became very clear that the idea of comprehensively analyzing the DNA of an organism, that is its genome, might be within hand. And the idea was, could we and should we launch a major initiative to try to study comprehensively the genomes of species that we're interested in, such as us, the humans. And, and so the field was named in the late 1980s, really um, immediately before the launching of an incredible part of the story of genomics, and that is, of course, the Human Genome Project. This was really the first phase of this journey I'm describing to you. It's an effort that started in 1990. Um, it was originally envisioned to take 15 years, ended up taking 13 years. It was international, involving many countries around the world, including um, uh, certainly French and uh, French scientists who joined and really were instrumental in helping advance the mission of the Human Genome Project. Um, and it was large, it was audacious, and the good news is that it was successful. And in 13 years, the Genome Project accomplished all of its goals, including reading out for the very first time all the letters of the human genome, all roughly three billion letters of our blueprint. But the Genome Project ended about 15 years ago. Um, and so, in fact, uh, when you really think about it, uh, that was sort of the end of the first phase of genomics. Um, but now that we really think back, there, in, in thinking about the first three decades of this field, I thought it might be useful to sort of review very quickly what have been the highlights. What have been the main things that the field of genomics has brought in the first uh, three decades? Well, I already told you about the first one. That was we read out the sequence of the human genome for the very first time by the Human Genome Project, completed 15 years ago. What I can tell you is that starting 15 years ago, it became very clear um, that having accomplished the signature effort of genomics, it was really time to broaden our thinking and begin to pursue what all of us dreamed that one day might be possible if we had been successful at reading out the sequence of the human genome. And that many of us who were involved in genomics from the beginning, such as myself, I got involved in the Genome Project when I was training as a pathologist, having just gotten my MD-PhD degree very much embraced the idea of thinking about how to apply these new tools of genomics to medicine. And so very much what we have done, certainly at the institute and, uh, that I direct now, the National Human Genome Research Institute at the U.S.'s National Institutes of Health, this becomes the aspirational goal of genomics, in embracing the idea that genomics can be used for the practice of medicine. And really here we recognize that 
medicine is practiced so far in a very imprecise way where we treat most patients as if they're the same. But each of us is slightly different. Each of us has slightly different blueprint due to differences in our genome. And could we enable an emerging field of medicine whereby information about an individual's genome is used as part of their medical care? We refer to this as genomic medicine. Some people refer to it as personalized medicine, individualized medicine. Later, I'm going to tell you about precision medicine. But what I want to really emphasize here is genomic medicine, focusing on geno the each unique genome of a given patient and using that unique information as part of their medical care. Now, the journey, which is really the second phase of this journey to genomic medicine, really began 15 years ago. It couldn't even have been contemplated until the Genome Project had read out that first sequence of a human genome. And sometime in the future, we will realize genomic medicine comprehensively, but it is the goal that we sort of are all trying to attain. And starting 15 years ago, until we realized genomic medicine, we recognize this is going to be a long journey. It's going to have many steps. We don't even know what all of the steps are. We also know for sure it's not going to involve a, run, a sprint. It's not going to happen quickly. It's not going to involve one researcher or one clinician. It's not going to involve one country. It's going to be a worldwide effort of many people from many disciplines working shoulder to shoulder for many years, sort of analogous to a marathon. Well, how do you actually organize efforts? How do you strategically think about how you're going to progress from the Genome Project, which was certainly very difficult, to something as even more complicated, such as realizing genomic medicine and changing the practice of medicine? Well, one of the things that worked well for us in the Human Genome Project was when thinking about this audacious progression from the Genome Project to genomic medicine, it would be helped if we had strategic plans that the scientific community helped to create that were published that could be followed. And those strategic plans were instrumental, a series of them, to accomplish the goals of the Genome Project. So in the United States, our institute led a strategic planning process that the day the Genome Project ended, we published in Nature that described what needed to be done immediately after the Genome Project was completed. That strategic plan was quite effective but needed to be renewed, so by 2011 we published a new one. And in particular, this strategic plan that we published directly embraced genomic medicine as the important goal to be pursuing in genomics. So with these two strategic plans as our guides, for the second phase of this journey of genomics, what have been the other highlights? I, I don't have time to describe the other highlights in detail, but I just want to tell you a little bit about what each of the other five major highlights I think are worth emphasizing about genomics in its first three decades. First highlight relates to the technological challenge of sequencing a human genome. Um, let me remind you that the Human Genome Project sequenced successfully the first uh, human genome read out the three billion letters, but it took about six to eight years of actively sequencing human DNA, and it cost, at the end of the day, about one billion dollars, U.S. dollars. It was a good money spent, but that was pretty expensive for something that we wanted to apply to individual patients as part of medical care. Immediately, when the Genome Project ended, we thought it was critically important to have new technologies for sequencing DNA. And we put out many grants to try to stimulate those innovations. The private sector got involved. Many companies were formed. To cut to the chase, over the last 15 years, we have seen the cost of sequencing a human genome reduced by nearly one million fold. We essentially can now sequence a human genome for roughly 1,000 U.S. dollars, whereas 15 years ago it cost us about a billion dollars. This has been transformative for genomics. It's actually been transformative for many areas of biomedical research. I would say without question, we will look back on history and say that this phase of technology development was unbelievably successful in the reduction of the cost of DNA sequencing and how that has facilitated the rapid dissemination of genomics across many areas of biomedicine and even other areas of, of biology. Empowered with the ability to sequence genomes very inexpensively, of course, that allowed us to then use those technologies to begin to sequence other genomes. And of course, that's always what we were interested in. We were never interested in one hypothetical human genome sequence. We're interested in how all of us differ. 
And it turns out that any two people in the audience, you differ about one out of a thousand letters across your entire genome. About 99.9% .9 identical, but one out of a thousand places you have a different letter in, in your genome compared to the person sitting next to you. And it actually turns out that most of those differences are fairly common in the population, and about one to five percent of the people will have that change, will have that difference. And so it became conceivable that we could catalog the most common variants that exist in the human population. In order to do that, we had to sequence a lot of people. And now, we've now only sequenced one human genome sequence 15 years ago. We have now sequenced tens of thousands of human genomes. In fact, it's probably at this point hundreds of thousands of human genomes. And through a series of major international programs that involve doing this in a cooperative way and sharing the data and putting up the catalogs of differences that exist among our genomes um, on the Internet for scientists to use, we have now advanced our understanding of human genomic variation. I'll give you a number. Fifteen years ago, when the Genome Project ended, we knew about several tens of thousands of places in the human genome that people differed, that there was a variant existing at that position. Now we know about over 100 million places in the human genome that people differ. We know what those differences are. They're available on the Internet for scientists to study. What that means is we have in hand not all of the variation that exists in our genomes around the world, but we have a lot of it, and at least we have the most common variants that we could now study to try to figure out which of those variants are relevant in biology, which ones of those variants are relevant in, for, for medicine, and, and how might the information about those variants be used for how we manage and treat patients. But in order to make that progression, we need to understand when you have a variant in the genome sitting at a position, does it have functional consequences? In order to understand that, you actually have to know where are the functional sequences in the human genome. Remember, the Genome Project just gave us the three billion letters of the genome, the G's, A's, T's, and C's. It didn't tell us where were the genes, it didn't tell us where were the other functional sequences and so forth. And so we've now had 15 years of effort in trying to interpret the human genome sequence. And we've come quite far. In fact, I would say that we've made profound advances in understanding how the human genome actually functions. For example, we now know that the human genome has about 20,000 genes. We now know where those genes are, and we know a pretty good inventory about uh, those particular protein coding portions of the human genome. However, we've also come to learn that genes Oh, and the protein coding genes only account for about 1 percent or 1 and a half percent of the human genome sequence. And there is a much larger percent of the human genome that is functionally important but functions in ways other than encoding proteins. And in fact, we have come to learn that this non-coding functional sequences are actually probably even more important than the genes in terms of d d um, providing the complexity of humans because those are the sequences that dictate where, when, and how much genes are turned on at different stages in development and under different conditions. And so we, have a, we are characterizing these non-coding portions of the genome, but we have a long way to go. So I would say that when the Genome Project ended uh, 15 years ago, we probably knew about this much about how the human genome works. Uh, now we probably know about this much about how the human genome works, and ultimately we need to know this much. So we've made great progress, but it's been just the first 15 years. We will continue for decades to come to interpret, reinterpret, and continue to characterize the human genome. Well, having in hand the ability to sequence DNA inexpensively in better and better catalogs of variants that exist in the human population in terms of genomic variants and better appreciation for functional sequences in the genome, it has empowered us to take those tools into the laboratory and begin to better understand the genomic basis of human disease. And here I would say that we've made significant advances in unraveling the genomic basis of human disease, and you'll hear about some of the more details of this in other speakers today. But in particular, what I would say is we have seen a very rapid acceleration in our ability to really understand at a genomic level the underpinnings of many types of human disease. This has been most pronounced for rare genetic diseases, diseases that are caused by mutations that break a single gene in the genome and cause a disease. I'll give you another number. The day the Genome Project began, in October 1 of 1990, there were 61 rare diseases that we knew 
what was mutated in the human genome, 61. Now that number is getting close to 5,000. There are now nearly 5,000 rare human diseases that we know what gene is mutated to cause that disease. We've also made significant advances in cancer by sequencing cancer genomes and better understanding the derangements that take place uh, that lead up to cancer. Where we have made progress but have a long way to go are common diseases. These are diseases like diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's and autism and mental illness, where it's not a single gene that's involved like rare diseases, but rather it's multiple variants in multiple different parts of the human genome with what is often a greater influence of environmental, social, and lifestyle factors. But here we are making great strides, and we are through various very large studies that are, we are associating particular regions of the genome that seem to contain variants that confer risk for those diseases, and slowly but surely we are teasing out what the genomic variants are that are conferring that risk. This will be a major growth area for ne over the next 10 years, where I think we will get much better understanding about the genomic basis of common diseases, uh, and hopefully we'll see the kind of acceleration we have seen with the um, understanding of the genomic basis of rare diseases that has transpired over the last 10 and 15 years. So those are the first five highlights, but I've said nothing about the practice of medicine. And in fact, I'll be honest with you, probably seven or eight years ago when I would give a talk like this, I would end here and say, these are the highlights so far in genomics. But I don't have to end here anymore because what's become very exciting is that we are now beginning to see vivid examples of genomic medicine in reality actually starting to emerge. And I can tell you for the first time, we are really bringing genomic medicine into focus. We're only seeing just the early, early examples of genomic medicine, but they're vivid enough to teach us that this is going to become a reality. And from these early lessons, uh, we're going to be able to extrapolate what will be needed to see genomic medicine be more widely practiced. And I'm often asked, well, what are the examples? What, what, are, what are these vivid examples where genomic medicine is emerging? What are the hot areas? I'll just briefly list them, um, but they really do illustrate, I think, in many ways what, are, what we'll see in the future. First is cancer. If you would ask me what will be the first and most significant impact of genomics on medicine, I would absolutely tell you it's going to be cancer. Cancer is a disease of the genome. Our ability to read out uh, the genome of a cancer, of an individual patient, and learn a tremendous amount is, is clear and will be implemented clinically more and more for more types of cancer. For some types of cancer, getting genomic information on the tumor is really considered standard of care. That list will grow considerably, and I believe the entire practice of cancer care will become completely different over the next five and ten years because of genomics. Second area, here and now, will absolutely grow. Big word, pharmacogenomics, pharmacology and genomics. Why is it that so many medications only work in a subset of people and don't work in other people? We have come to learn that a lot of that variation in our response to medications are due to genomic variants that influence the, the pathways that metabolize drugs. And it, we now are beginning to appreciate the fact that up front you can predict whether somebody will be a good responder or a bad responder or will need a high dose or a low dose of a particular medication based on the unique set of variants they contain at particular places in their genome. And so pharmacogenomics will become routine. It's now routine for certain medications. That list is expected to grow in the coming decade. Third hot area, this has been remarkable how quickly this has seen realization. The use of genomics for diagnosing rare genetic diseases. I will tell you that 10 years ago, many of us thought, wouldn't it be amazing if someday we could have a patient in front of us, not know what is wrong with them, sequence their genomes, figure it out. Starting about six and seven years ago, a few examples uh, came to be that actually that worked. And then the examples kept coming and coming and coming. And now it is routine that if you have a patient with a rare disease and you have evaluated them clinically and you do not know what is wrong with them, you should just sequence their genome. It's less expensive than continued medical workup. And in somewhere between a third to half the time, you will figure out what is wrong with them based on sequencing their genome. That percentage will get better and better over time as we get better at interpreting, 
But right now, around the world, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of patients with rare diseases who get their genome sequenced every single month. This has now become standard of care in the case of patients with rare diseases for which you simply do not know what is wrong with the individual. The fourth area, actually, by sheer numbers, is the number one use of genomic medicine. Prenatal genetic te genomic testing has been going on for decades, but previously has involved accessing the fetal DNA through procedures like amniocentesis, which is invasive and actually is a little risky to the pregnancy, but that was the only way to get to the fetal DNA to analyze it. But it actually turns out that these fancy new methods for sequencing DNA have become so exquisitely sensitive that they allow one to detect the small amounts of fetal DNA that naturally shed from the placenta and float around in the maternal bloodstream. And so now you could take a simple blood draw from a pregnant mom, analyze the, the cell-free DNA that is naturally present in her blood, and end up doing the same kind of screening that one traditionally did through more invasive methods to analyze the fetal DNA. This is known as non-invasive genetic testing or non-invasive prenatal genetic testing. Um, and the uptake worldwide has been remarkable. In fact, it is predicted that this year between four to six million pregnant women will have this non-invasive prenatal genetic testing performed. So by sheer, and it's all because of these new technologies for sequencing DNA that allow such a screening to take place. So by sheer number, this is the number one use of genomic medicine to date. So these are the four hot areas. There are other exciting areas that are emerging, but this is why I celebrate the fact that genomic medicine is now becoming in focus. So that's the first three decades of genomics, sort of the past up to the present. And I want to shift gears and just give you a few examples of the present, because you can tell that I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, I'm very positive, I'm very proud of genomics, but I also will tell you I I have a realistic view of things. And there are a number of realities that we face right now that are both challenging, but with them also provide pretty important opportunities for research and additional advances. So I'm going to tell you about three realities that each come with them an opportunity. So reality number one. Reality number one is the fact that it now is trivial to generate a sequence of a human. It is trivial to generate a patient's genome. In fact, it goes on around the world probably hundreds if not thousands of times every single week and month. But it turns out that when we read out all of those letters of an individual patient's genome, um, we can interpret it and try to understand it. But for when you actually do that, you generate a list of something like three to five million differences that that person has in their genome compared to some reference genome. And the truth is, when you round on that patient in the morning, um, this is sort of what you feel like. Uh, you feel like you really don't know what most of those differences mean, um, especially for um, a patient with a condition other than a rare disease or a patient that is otherwise healthy. So while we can generate a genome sequence very trivially, actually clinically understanding the meaning of that sequence is far from trivial. It is not trivial at all. And we're at a very strange stage where we have the technological ability to read out somebody's genome. We don't yet have the analytical capabilities of completely understanding what all the differences mean. Meanwhile, we actually are accumulating a lot of scientific knowledge, but even translating that knowledge into clinical routine care is going to be a major challenge uh, for the coming decade. Uh, this is an opportunity, and one an opportunity we're certainly pursuing. But being able to routinely interpret completely a sequence of a patient's genome is a grand challenge and a grand opportunity that we will be pursuing in the coming decade. A new reality and opportunity, uh, number two, relates to the fact that the relevance of genomics has changed substantially in the three decades um, that I've been involved in the field since the beginning. You know, when I got involved in genomics uh, back uh, when the field was first created, it was really just a discipline of biomedical researchers. It was just people like me working away in the laboratory, maybe working a little bit of the computer, but it was a very self-contained scientific discipline. Fifteen years ago, when the Genome Project ended, um, it, it, we, we opened our tent up. We got healthcare professionals interested in the field because they recognized the opportunities for realizing genomic medicine. But really, in many ways, for a long time, it was still just a discipline involving scientists and healthcare professionals. But guess what? 
The second you touch medicine, the second you end up having genomics play a role in the care of cancer, in the prescription of medications, in the diagnosis of rare diseases, in the helping pregnant couples think about prenatal testing, all of a sudden genomics becomes relevant to patients. And once you're relevant to patients, you're also relevant for friends and relatives of patients because healthcare becomes very social and becomes sort of very much embedded within society. And so what the implications of this are is that no longer can we think about our discipline as just a research discipline and just a, a discipline maybe now relevant for medicine. It now becomes a discipline relevant to society. And more than anything, we recognize that there are many ethical, legal, and social implications of these genomic advances, and those are critically important for us to deal with um, and to study and to think about going forward. Now, it turns out we've been studying the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics actually dating back to the Genome Project. But now, but now more than ever, they're incredibly relevant um, as we start to integrate genomics into medicine. And every country has their own issues associated with medicine and medical care, and certainly the U.S. is no exception. And I can tell you we are spending a tremendous amount of effort thinking about how is genomics going to be regulated in medicine? How is it going to get paid for? How is genomic information going to become integrated within other information associated with patients' health care? And how are we going to make sure that they don't get discriminated based on that information about their genome? So we are dealing with many aspects of this, and I think going forward we're going to have to recognize that part of our responsibility as genomic scientists is to think about the societal implications and to work with relevant individuals to make sure that we protect people and that all this is, is beneficial to society overall. Third reality um, also, I think, points us to the future. Now, I've been he up here and clearly saying that genomics is a really exciting and important thing. But I, I readily admit that genomics isn't everything when it comes to human disease. In fact, if you think about most diseases, you could represent it as shown here in this pie chart, where there are contributions of genomic variants to the disease, but there's also other components of human disease that relate to lifestyle and relate to the environment and exposures and so forth. What's been exciting for genomics is that we are riding a very exciting wave of technological innovation that has allowed us to dissect the left side of this pie chart, because we've had these new technologies for analyzing DNA that has greatly accelerated our insights about the genomic basis of disease. But I think we can have already seen and can anticipate similar technical innovations that are going to allow us to decipher technologically the other contributors to human disease using health and environmental monitoring technologies. And when you can start to analyze both sides of this pie chart, you are enabling a sort of an emergence of yet a new discipline, if you will, or an expansion of what I've talked about previously, which is what is often being referred to as precision medicine. Now, by precision medicine, I mean a more precise accounting of individual variability. Earlier in my talk, I've emphasized individual variability of genomes. That's when I talked about genomic medicine, a narrow focus on genomics. But let's broaden that focus, not just think about genomics, think about individual variability as it relates to physiology with new technologies for measuring individuals' unique physiology. Think about broad needed to think about individual variability in lifestyle, how much we exercise, how much we sleep. Think about our individual variability as to what we're exposed to in our environment, and think about individual variability in other aspects of our life, like what we eat and what things we do to our bodies. This has led to the notion of precision medicine. Could we study and understand individual variability as it pertains to health and disease and eventually the practice of medicine? And the reason this is capturing so much excitement worldwide is really due to a confluence of several things. It's the idea that we've, we now have in hand and can readily generate immense amounts of genomic data, as I talked about earlier. Meanwhile, around the world, many, many countries have developed over the last 10 and 15 years much better electronic health records that capture in real time a lot of health data about individuals. Now, much of these electronic health systems have been mostly about billing and organizing medical care, but they contain 
inside of those systems, tremendous amounts of data that can then be used for research. And increasingly, in many countries, are harnessing that ability to analyze that data for research purposes. Oh, and then, of course, there's all these new technologies, wearable sensors, electronic health monitoring devices that can measure our physiology, measure our blood analytes, measure our exercise patterns, measure environmental exposures, and we will see even better and better technologies over the next decade. And one can imagine putting together immense amounts of data across these three domains and be able to analyze it in an unprecedented fashion. As a result, multiple countries around the world have set up very large population scale studies that capture genomic data, electronic health record data, increasingly other data using other technologies. In the United States, we uh, recently launched several years ago and are now very much established in a program called the All of Us Research Program. This is just the U.S.'s contribution. We're going to enlist and enroll and study over a million people, um, probably for the next few decades, uh, taking advantage of the kinds of data sets that I was just describing to you. We are not alone in the United States. In fact, we're not even ahead. I think the UK Biobank is an example, and there's other um, efforts around the world. In fact, recently we held a conference that was organized and shown in blue are all the different countries that have very large studies already ongoing. And the emphasis on the conference was, as with the Human Genome Project, can we get countries to work together, share data, and really bring very large amounts of, of precision medicine data together for researchers to analyze. This is a grand opportunity for the future, and it will take us beyond just genomics into a wider scope, if you will, of all the contributors of human disease, and perhaps give us the statistical power to tease out all the many subtle contributors to our health and well-being in a way that previously was just not possible. So this is a very exciting opportunity that really, I think, points us to the kinds of excitement we're starting to see in genomic medicine, and then broadening and thinking about what that might be like for precision medicine as we enter the next decade. So those are the, what I want to tell you about the past and a little bit about the present and realities and opportunities. And one of the things I hope you realize is that none of this actually is particularly easy. Um, it's actually pretty easy to make PowerPoint slides that make it look like it was simple and we knew exactly what we were doing as we progressed through genomics or as we think about what we're going to do in precision medicine. You know, but, but this is research. The, it is not a linear progression. Um, and in fact, it's a journey that looks more like this with many twists and turns and unanticipated. I, I could tell you quite candidly, um, during the Human Genome Project, we didn't really know what we were doing. We sort of figured it out as we went. We had no grand scheme of exactly how this was going to all happen. I could tell you with precision medicine and efforts like all of us that I'm involved with, we don't really know exactly how this is all going to work. We just sort of figure it out a little step at a time. Uh, if we really knew what we were doing, it would be a completely different thing. This is research. So just want to remind you that while all this looks great in hindsight, you know, as Albert Einstein once said, and here's a sign I have above my door in my office at NIH, you know, Einstein once said, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. And I just want to really emphasize that this is still pretty complicated and we don't know precisely how this is all going to play out. It's actually what made the Genome Project exciting. It's actually what makes precision medicine exciting. But it's with this spirit that if we really knew what we were doing, it would just happen. But this is research. We don't totally know what we're doing, which is why every once in a while you have to take a step back and say, all right, how exactly are we going to accomplish sort of the grand things that we can imagine happening one day? We need to have a sort of a, a way to sort of pursue that. And like those guides I introduced you to, those two strategic plans that we published since the end of the Genome Project, we recognize that we need another guide to sort of help us over the next decade or so. And so our institute recently kicked off a strategic planning process that we've entitled Genomics 2020. Uh, we've entitled it that because we're trying to create a 2020 vision for genomics. Um, that is one we will publish in 2020, uh, thus the name, and it's one that we think is going to sort of help us as a guide for genomics and precision medicine, thinking about the next decade. And so this process is a, a couple-year process, probably takes about two years, aimed to publish in 2020, and I don't have time to describe the detail to you, but I invite all of you to help us. Uh, this is not just an effort for the U.S. Always when we do strategic planning, we embrace this idea of having worldwide scientists and clinicians help us think through this. Um, and so you could hear about the things that we've done and our planning and, and as we publish things or put out uh, things to give comment to, just follow us on this website. If you have any questions, you could email us. 
um, and we, I have a staff that sort of deals with at, that material and ends up helping communicate what's going on in our strategic planning process. And if you want to follow us on social media, uh, we also have a hashtag. And so we've had about two dozen events at meetings in various venues. We have workshops coming up. And we, um, we have various other ways that we're trying to engage the worldwide community of scientists and clinicians to help us think about articulating as a guide to the journey starting in 2020 uh, for this exciting discipline of genomics. And then if one last thing is if you're at all interested in some of the things I've said or you want to follow our strategic planning process, I publish a monthly newsletter. Uh, if you want one extra email a month, you're welcome to sign up for it. If you just go to that, um, that uh, URL, you can sign up and, and we will be making sure that in my monthly newsletters we'll be updating you about what's happening in our strategic planning efforts. So with that, I will close and I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.